Welcome back to Miranda Media. Uh, I am Robert Miranda. And I am Monica Miranda. Uh, today we're going to be interviewing Garen Whited. And Sean Renette. Uh, I found their books on Audible. Uh, they're quite enjoyable. Today we'll be talking about one of his books, The Night Lord. How are you both doing today? Hi guys. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm doing great. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, Garen, uh, let's start off with you. Uh, also notice uh, that you used to be an IT specialist and everything. Do you feel there's other help for people in the IT field that they could get out? Or do you think they're just stuck in there forever? Well, uh, I'm not sure people in the IT business actually need help as such. Uh, it's not really a bad career. I mean, I could be happy doing the IT thing, no problem. Uh, it's just the tricky part of it being employed being employed anywhere, is finding a job you like to do. I happen to like writing. Hopefully enough people also like what I'm writing that I can keep on writing. Maybe I should have written that down. Did you always want to be a writer? If not, what did you want to do? Well, my first choice was astronaut. Uh, and it was actually a fairly realistic expectation compared to my second choice, which was wizard. Uh, so now I'm a writer because that's as close as I'm likely to get to getting off this rock. And of course, I get to make a certain kind of magic. It's not that bad a deal when you think about it. Your book, The Night Lord, it's part of a series. Uh, what all can you tell us about it? Well, one of my reviewers pointed out that Night Lord, uh, the series, the books, you know, they're, they're, you have to read them. Uh, Every, try, every time they try to summarize the thing, uh, I start to sound like a, a, a lunatic. Uh, it's like summarizing Doctor Who or Game of Thrones. Uh, well, I guess a good place to start, at least, is the, is the narrator, Eric. Uh, he's a science guy, physics, computer sciences, that kind of thing, and he doesn't believe in vampires, magic, religion, or any of that stuff. Uh, then he becomes a vampire, and that's somewhat disconcerting and really messes with his worldview. Uh, you follow that with angry demons, pissed off deities, and a whole fantasy world of weirdness. And you got a good start on how the series goes. But uh, I think my favorite description is something from another reviewer. Uh, he said the, the Night Lord series is kind of like the love child of Anne Rice and Sir Terry Pratchett, raised by Arthur C. Clarke. I can live with that. A lot of authors use personal experience as the inspiration for their characters in many of their books. The character Eric in The Night Lord, is he based on someone you know? Are there traits of yourself in any of your characters? Well, there are always things from what we call reality that seep into fiction. Uh, the larger pieces, no. I, I don't have fangs, I don't have blood fetish, and I certainly don't have bronze, much to my dismay. On the other hand, I do understand a little about physics and computers. Um, I know a couple of redheads, and I have an aversion to sunlight. It's the little things, really. Um, Eric and I do share many of the same attitudes. Uh, of course, we differ on a lot of things, too. I, mean, I, I, I just bear in mind he's a blood-drinking monster of the night, and I just move on. On average, how long did it take you to finish writing the Night Lord book series so far? Well, that's actually kind of hard to say. Uh, I didn't work on Sunset, the first one, at all consistently. Uh, Shadows took quite a while, too. I had a, I had a nasty case of sequelophobia, the fear that the second book will be awful in comparison to the first. Fortunately, that doesn't seem to be the case. So, Orb, Orb on the other hand, uh, I wrote that straight out, full-time, as a job. Not as a hobby, not as something done in between all the other stuff. Uh, so on average, I'd say it takes about four years. But by contrast, Orb, the, the latest one, only took about eight months. Uh, it's really all just a matter of how much time I have to actually sit down and write. Your books contain a lot of visual details. Is this research that you do, or is it pre-learned knowledge? If so, do you, where do you typically go to do your research? Well, uh, I do have years, decades really, of uh, practice visualizing for role-playing games. Uh, and, of course, I have a, the typical geek's level of experience with, with movies. Uh, I've seen things on the big screen, and 
in my head uh, that would send invading invading aliens just scurrying for hyperspace. Um, the real trick is describing it adequately, and I think that's what makes the writer. Uh, now I do research things, uh, though, and you know my Google foo is strong. Uh, I've never had to know what the African bird spider looks like, but if I need to, okay, I look it up on Google. Uh, of course, I'm old enough that I used to have to wander through the library stacks and hunt down a reference. This is much easier, so I'm very pleased about that. Makes things go much more quickly. Have you ever taken uh, inspiration from other authors that you met or admired? Oh yes, that can't be helped. Uh, what you read goes into your brain. It mixes with everything else in there and eventually it becomes part of you. Then everything you do is colored in some fashion, to some degree, by that. Who you are and what you do is pretty much determined by what you learn, what you know. So yeah, uh, every author I've ever read in some way, shape, or form, they're in there somewhere. Do you ever have any of your family reading your books? and? If so, do they ever give you pointers? Well, if they do read my books, they haven't mentioned it to me. Uh, most of my family aren't really sci-fi or fantasy people. I'm, I'm really the sci-fi fantasy geek. Come to that, I'm really the only geek in my family, all things considered, so I'm not terribly surprised. When you start writing in a book, do you set deadlines uh, for yourself, such as like so many pages or paragraphs per day? Nope. The story comes out as the story comes out. I type until my fingers are tired, and then I do something along the lines of, you know, normal life maintenance. Laundry, food, sleep, that kind of thing. And then I go right back and type some more. Occasionally, I go back and reread something and edit, but not, not while I'm actually doing the writing. That usually comes later. But, uh, again, usually I'm writing, and it's straight out of the brain, down through the fingers, right into the keys. That's, that's, that's just the way it runs. What is your favorite way to write? Do you take notes? Well, I type. I, I can write by hand and if I have to, but it takes an awful lot longer. I'm, I'm just thinking much faster than I type, and writing things out longhand frustrates me because it takes so much time to get the idea down. I've got, it, hopefully it's an important idea because I usually have three or four at a time, and they're all vying for time and space. So I type. It minimizes my frustration. A lot of classic stories have some sort of life lesson hidden in the tale. If you had to choose to give a lesson to your audience, what would it be? Uh, I, I don't know that I've got a lesson to teach anyone. Uh, there, there might be some significant bits of wisdom or the occasional life lesson, but that's because those would be, those would be in its incidentals. Uh, they're not the purpose of the stories. I'm not writing fables. I'm not Aesop. I'm, I'm, I'm not even writing literature. I'm not writing timeless classics. I'm writing stories. If there happens to be something significant in them, it's, it's because art imitates life. Uh, it's there because life itself has moments of significance. Have you ever had a fan tell you that their books changed them somehow? And if so, how? No, not yet. I mean, like I just said, I mean, I'm not really trying to write something significant and inspiring, just amusing all over. I do look forward to the occasion when a vampire comes up to me and says, I loved your books, they gave me new hope for my own life, and so on. So, you know, just, yeah, talk to me in a hundred years, see if I'm still here. We'll discuss that then. What is the easiest thing about writing? Well, for me, the hardest thing about writing is getting people to leave me alone to do it. It's 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 a reclusive thing to do. I'm everything in there, everything in creation comes out and bothers you and distracts you from what you're doing, and everything has to all fit together precisely. Writing is one of those things you just can't do with a lot of distractions. And for me, it's people. Uh, the whole world wants something, and it's always in some way a piece of my time, whether it's answering mail, email, or the phone, text messages, someone ringing my doorbell, whatever, they're bothering me in the middle of something. And they don't know. They don't know. So I try not to be annoyed too much. Uh, as for the easiest thing about writing, that's actually doing the writing. If I've already got the story sorted out, I've got the idea, I know where I'm going, I know how to get there, all that remains is to actually put words into the machine. And that's, for me, that's the easy part. 
Do you ever get writer's block? And if so, how do you get around it? Uh, yes. Yes, I have a writer's block. They give it to you when you publish a book. Uh, it's a big cardboard box, so you can put your laptop on it when you're writing someplace that doesn't have a tape. Uh, it's awkward to type when the keyboard's on the floor. See, so. No, seriously. Um, I don't understand writer's block. I, I've never gotten it. I don't get it. I, I don't know how this works. Uh, there, I've got too many ideas, not too few. Uh, ideas are, are like air. They're around me constantly, all the time, all trying to get in. I just take a breath. There's a new idea, and and that's that, that's it for me. I, I don't understand writer's block. Talk to me again later, maybe, but for now, mm -mm. fresh idea. Let's get going. Have you ever second guessed yourself after you've finished a book and it's been published? If so, how did you handle that? Well, there are actually several stages to writing. Uh, first, there's the enthusiasm, the, the honeymoon phase of having a whole brand new idea, a new, a new work to work on. Uh, the second is uh, the despair at how awful this pile of trash is. Uh, and then third, there's the hopelessness that you'll ever finish this. And fourth, and I think the final phase, is the resignation to just turn it loose in the world and let people like it or not, no matter what. See, one of the great keys to happiness is not really caring. Uh, you like it, you don't like it. You love it, you hate it, whatever. It's a book. It's not my soul. You're judging the book, you're not judging me. Do whatever you like with the with the book. Uh, I certainly don't know what's going to be a commercial success. All I do, I write stuff. And that's all. Can you tell us about the artwork for your books? I see on Audible that they have some different uh, cover art for your books. Can you tell us more about that? Do you ever collaborate or design the artwork yourself? Well, for the actual book covers, I usually just commission something. I often have an idea, then the artist turns it into something visual. And a good thing, too. I'm about the stick figure level of artist myself. I, I'm not a visual medium type guy. Uh, but uh, the covers on Audible are different. Uh, they were done by Podium Publishing. Uh, I don't know who they got to do it, whether it was in-house or they farmed it out or, or what, but uh, I think they did pretty well on those as well. I, I'm, I'm very pleased with it. Do you think the cover art plays an important role into the success of the books? Frankly, I have no idea. I think so. Uh, again, visual media, not my area. Uh, I assume that it helps uh, since they're pretty eye-catching. Uh, if it grabs attention, then at least there's a chance for someone to look further and discover they like the work behind it. But uh, I, I can't tell. I mean, I'd, I'd go for a statistical analysis, analysis and try releasing a book without a cover and see how it does with the exact same book with a cover and you know, go from there. But until then, I have no real opinion. Again, I'm a writer. I don't do the visual media thing and I really don't understand it. My brain just isn't wired that way. Is there a special way that you like to market your books? What are your views on social media? Well, uh, generally I send out emails to publicist services and then go back to writing the next book. Uh, when I can't write because I'm too hungry, I eat and then answer my accumulated emails. Uh, I should probably take more time to be a marketing person, but I hate marketing. Damn it, Jim, I'm a writer, not a salesman. Uh, and as for social media, well, it's a hell of a distraction. Uh, I'm told it's important to pay attention to it, but I'm just not that social. Again, I'm a writer. Would you ever want your books made into a movie? And if so, who would you want to play as the lead role? Oh, I, I sincerely doubt anyone's going to be making a, the Night Lord books into a movie. Uh, each of them is pushing like a third of a million words, uh, or roughly between three and four copies of The Hobbit each. Uh, on the other hand, a series, a la Game of Thrones, perhaps, uh, that, that might work out. Uh, as for who plays what roles, uh, I, I'm not sure. I, I don't have any actors in mind uh, while I'm writing it, uh, if that's what you're asking. Um, I suppose Michael Fassbender. I think highly of him. Uh, uh, maybe Nikolai Coster waldro Either one of those would, uh, would probably make a good Eric. Uh, but uh, they'd, they'd both do pretty well in just about anything. Uh, I also think highly of Olivia Wilde. I like her. Uh, she might do well as Tamara with the, you know, appropriate changes to the hair. Uh, but again, I'm no casting director. I, I'll, I'll leave it to the professionals. What are your thoughts on good and bad reviews? 
Well, they exist. Uh, I generally don't read them. I mean, what would be the point? I mean, to get warm fuzzies that somebody likes it, or to be depressed and angry that someone doesn't? Uh, I already wrote it. It exists. I'm busy writing the next one now. Um, although, to be fair, I, 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 am, I am pleased to see that, you know, I've got generally good reviews on pretty much everything I've written. Uh, there are, of course, always the, you know, some sorehead somewhere who either didn't get the point or was mistaken about the genre of the, of the work. But, so what? If I paid attention to the reviews, I'd be busy reading them all the time. And most people want me to be writing all the time. So, I can do that. I'll do the writing. I'll go down that road. I'm on it. Most writers have a target audience when they write books. The series The Night Lords, did you have a target audience for that one? Uh, people? I didn't name it at any particular demographic, if that's what you're asking. No, I didn't. Uh, it's, it's just stories, um, I suppose. Yes, it is the audience that actually reads it. People, I mean, unless there's an awful lot of artificial intelligences and aliens lurking on the planet. So, yeah. Do you have any, any amusing stories about at book shows where things did not go as expected? Eh, well, not really. Um, the closest thing I can think of is uh, at one con, uh, a guy dressed as a Canterlot Palace guard uh, came over and hung around pretty much all day. Uh, he was funny. He himself was funny, and uh, he helped attract a lot of attention to my table. Good going there. Uh, it was unexpected, certainly, but I can't really call it an amusing story. So, Are there any special things you like to do when uh, to relax when you are not writing? Well, first off, writing is how I relax. Although I do other things now and again, I, I play role-playing games, uh, I watch movies, I read, all that. If it's indoorsy stuff, I'm pretty much on it. Do you ever give copies of your books to families or friends when you don't know what to get them? If so, how did they react? Oh no, no, no. That's, that's just ego and actually rather poor taste. Uh, you always put some thought into a gift, and you don't give a gift that's more about you than about the receiver. It, it, it's a rule. No, it's one of my rules. If they want one, all they have to do is ask. But the, the idea that I'm just going to give them one of these on the theory that this is the perfect gift for them, what does that say about me? When did you first start working with Sean, and how does it compare to working with other voice actors? Well, uh, Sean kicked off the Night Lord series with the audio for Sunset, and uh, that would be you know, so a couple of years now. Uh, as for how he compares to others, well, he's, he's still doing the Night Lord series. He's got uh, Night Lord Orb, the third one, coming out uh, here shortly. Uh, so that, that says something right there. You know, he's done well enough that we're keeping him. So, you know, I'm, I'm pleased with him. Sean rocks. He does. He's better than I am. So, yeah, let's do that. I'm glad Podium found him. Many readers like myself really like how you explain how the magic works in the books. What is the inspiration behind your take on the magic? Well, um, magic. Uh, I was thinking about it and wondering how it would work. So I invented a system that a physicist could work on and slowly figure out. Uh, Eric is still in that process as of book three. Uh, he's got working theories, but he's a long way from truly understanding how it all fits together. So. Will Eric find the staff in book three? I feel it has an important role in the books as a whole. No, he's not going to find it in book three. Book four, maybe. Uh, he lost it during uh, book one, when the ship he was on sank. So it's drifted on the ocean for a while. Now, whether it was found or just washed ashore, that's another story. Uh, possibly, literally, another story. I could, I could write that as a separate standalone, I suppose. Maybe I will. In the books, Bronze has a big role in the story. Is the relationship between Bronze and Eric's based on a like of horses? Well, no. I wouldn't say so. Uh, I like horses, yes. Uh, more than I like most animals, but uh, I'm, I'm not an outdoorsy person at all. And, and they make terrible indoor pets. Uh, on the other hand, Bronze is only partly a horse. Uh, she's also part statue, part horse, part Eric. Uh, I, I, it's kind of expected that they would be close. They, they share kind of, a, they, they share a very special bond. But 
it, it doesn't come from my innate love of horses. It comes from the magical way in which she was created. Thank you, Garen, for taking time out of your day to help us with this. Where can viewers go to find more about your work or more about yourself? Well, the easy way is just to Google, do a web search for my name, Garen Whited. Uh, you'll find my website, garenwhited.com. Uh, you'll also find my Facebook page, also under that name. Uh, I'm, I'm easy to find. Take your pick. Sean Renette. How have your experiences been with Garen Whited? My experiences with Garen, uh, I really enjoy doing Garen's books. Um, I think we're on three, is it three? Orb, uh, we just, just wrapped. Um, A, the length of them means that when I record it, I get to drop into the world and not come back out for a while, which is fantastic. It's like going for a, uh, a long drive and not worrying about how much gas you've got in the car because you know <laughs> you put in a big gas tank. Um, I really enjoy working with Garen. Um, I, I enjoy the thoroughness uh, and the consideration and the time he takes with the characters and developing everything in the world. Um, I really enjoyed this last one, the way it wrapped back around and is sort of bringing everything back together. So I'm very excited to see where we go for the next book. Where does the inspiration for your voices come from? The inspiration for my voice is, uh, you know, the writing. Uh, it's, if, it's in the, if it's in the book, um, then I can do it. If it's not, then I'm laying something on top of the book and I'm, I'm sort of forcing it to do what I want, which is, to my mind, um, and not only counterproductive, but insulting to the author. And I'm not saying that when other people do it, it's wrong. It's just that that's how I do it. Um, I used to be a, a director and a producer, and I was always happiest when people were doing things that came organically from the book. If somebody walked into the room with a bunch of characters that they'd developed prior to recording the book, you know, things that, that they leaned on because they were safe or that they knew... I would try to steer them away from that and just keep it book focused. Uh, and I try to do that with myself. It's hard because I direct myself. Uh, it's just me and the booth. Um, so that is sort of difficult to maintain. But at the same time, because of the length of Garen's books, it's easier because once I lock into that groove, I don't have to worry about, you know, resetting uh, my head at the end of every week or at the end of every three or four days when I finish a book. So, um, so that is where the inspiration for the voice, I, I lay, if, if anything has ever bothered you about my performances, it's, it's not my fault. It's Garen's fault. He, he wrote it that way. Okay. Did you ever pull a Ferris Bueller? and call into school or work using one of your voices? No, uh, I have not. I have not skipped school for a while. Um, and in terms of not showing up for work, that would literally mean not doing my voices. So um, I wish I could. Unfortunately, my boss is a dick. Um, me. So that is a problem. I can't really fake myself out. Plus, my schedules are my schedules. And if I, uh, if I start to deviate a little bit, or if I start taking a little me time uh, that's not in the calendar, then uh, really it turns into uh, us time, we time, you time, the author's time. And I don't want to do that. So... However, if I do fake it out ever, uh, I'll do it via email. It's so much easier to fake being sick when you're typing. Did I say that out loud? Did you ever have to do voice lessons as a kid? Uh, did I ever take voice lessons as a kid? Yes. I went to acting school for a goodly portion of my, uh, my late teens and early 20s. Um, I went to the American Repertory Theaters Institute uh, in Boston, and I was at LA City College before that. Uh, and then after that, I have been taking voice lessons. Um, it depends on, uh, sometimes it was just, you know, uh, surrounding a specific play or something that I was doing, but um, that's all helped me. 
um, with this, not necessarily with characters, but with being able to record a book over, uh, if I do three hours a day of finished recorded material, that means I've spent seven or eight hours recording, and that is hard on this little box here. And this, you know, all of this is just a mess, so keeping it in line, it's, it's very hard to do. Um, and it, it takes a little bit of training. Some people, out of the box, they're gorgeous. They're amazing. They have amazing voices. Drop dead. You could listen to them all day. Um, I'm not one of those, so I have to work for it. Would you say there is a limit to the number of voices you can do? Is there a limit to the number of voices I can do? Yes. <laughs> I'm not that guy. I'm I'm just I'm not like a voice actor. I I tend to um, I tend to spend much more time developing the arguments within a book than I do developing character voices because to me that's more performative uh, than it is um, about the book. It's more about me as an actor than uh, than it is about the book itself. And I'd rather get out of the way. I'd rather have the uh, author and the listener connect more directly and the less brocade or or um, acting that I put in the way the better there's a you know there's a difference between not acting and being a completely monotone unlistenable robot that's not what I mean um, although I think I sometimes skew more toward that than acting but uh, sorry my phone um, yeah there is that that is the limit to the voices I can do. I mean, if it's in if it's in the book, I will try to do them faithfully as as well as I can, and I'll try to keep track of them and all the rest of that. Uh, beyond that, I have no idea. I am no Jim Dale. There is there is no threat to him in the Guinness Book of World Record for um, for the amount of voices done in an audiobook. Have you ever used the same voice for two different characters in the story? Yeah, um, there are, you know, if you're running into 19, 20, 30 hours in a book, you're going to run into a lot of people that, that have, they, they'll run into a room and go, hey, monsters are outside the room. And if you give every single one of them a different voice, you'll go crazy. You'll end up with, you know, hello, there are monsters in the room. You know, it's like, at, at a certain point, it's like, dude, come on, just get to the story. So, yes, I have. Also, sometimes I've done it just because I'm a bad actor, for which I apologize. Whenever you first start a new book, uh, do you read the whole book from start to finish, or do you just come up to characters as you go along with it? When it comes to preparing a book uh, and, and reading a book, I have to read it beforehand. If I don't, I, I don't know... It's very difficult to track the characters' motivations when you're just reading or just reading them for the first time, when you're just meeting them. Uh, and if, if I don't know who they are off the bat, then my characterization is going to change over the course of the book as I begin to understand them as characters and understand their motivations and, you know, what's driving them. And um, so if I don't read it beforehand, I am doing a vast and horrible disservice to the book. I will not say that I have not done that in the past. Um, sometimes there have been a few instances where the time crunch uh, regarding getting a book out was such that uh, I had to dive in. So I was reading uh, a day ahead, which I hate to do. Um, and it was, those were some of the, uh, the, the worst books I've ever recorded on. I will never tell you which ones they were. Um, and they are the ones that give me the most trouble when I think back to them, because I know that the work that I did for whatever reason, um, it was not up to par. Well, not for whatever reason, because I hadn't read ahead was not up to par with what it should have been. And it didn't take into account the, the scope of the book, which is paramount. I mean, it's all about the book. If, if it's about me, then I'm screwing it up. Have you ever finished an audiobook only to have the author of the book contact you to change a voice that you've done? No. Um, I've had discussions with them about stuff going forward, about how things can be tweaked, but um, generally no. Um, again, characterization, not my, you know, that's not what is going to make somebody cast me. Um, 
so yeah, we we rarely get into fisticuffs over uh, over you know which voice. Uh, I have had people thank me for trying to get accents right. Uh, I, I know some of some of my my peers will, when they hit a hard accent or something, will. I, I don't want to say blow it off, but stay in their comfort zone. And I will, if it's an accent, I'll try to push a little harder to get it. Uh, the difficulty there is that often I'm wrong. So <laughs> so when it works out, uh, I'm happy. And when it doesn't, you know, you get points for trying. And nobody really gets that mad at you. And again, I don't lean so heavily into it that you can't hear the rest of the book. So, so far. So as of now, nobody has called me to tell me to redo something. Also, redoing, very expensive. So that's not so good for everybody. So they're going to kind of stick with what we got. I have also noticed from your Facebook that you like riding bikes. Is, do you have any other hobbies that you like to do? I do indeed like riding bikes. Um, it is possibly the largest animating force in my life, aside from my wife, uh, and she's not that big. Um, I, I race, I race, uh, I race uh, here in the U.S., and um, I am hoping to go to Europe at some point in, in the not-so-distant future to race in Belgium. Um, I was a state champ a little while ago in a very obscure medium called cyclocross, and I love it to death. And I've actually started a, a small publishing company that deals specifically with cycling books, uh, audiobooks called Sporty Books. And um, uh, my connection to cycling goes back to when I was a very small kid, and it was the only way to get away from, you know, the the day to day boredom and horror of being a child. And, um, and it's just stayed with me, uh, ever since, you know, the, uh, the, the ability to get on a bike and, um, and push yourself, uh, and discover things about yourself and meet people and, uh, all the rest of that, plus all the equipment. It's fantastic. It's, uh, it's very hard to, uh, to not, for me, to not be completely, um, uh, enamored of it. Uh, as for other uh, hobbies, driving to and from races, um, <laughs> that's, that's about it. Uh, I'm repairing my car after driving to and from races. Um, yeah, beyond that, not not a lot of extra time beyond that. I do drink beer. That it, is that a hobby? I'm not sure that's a hobby. Do you ever do readings in public? Yes, occasionally. Um, I've done a couple for uh, Audiophile and the Audiobook Publishing Association. Um, I did one recently at um, uh, APAC, uh, which is our big conference in Chicago. And uh, then I was uh, fortunate enough to be able to go down to Scares the Care down in, um, in uh, Virginia and uh, read the first couple of pages of Mark Tufo's Zombie Fallout book. Um, to an audience, which was awesome, because Mark was there, and then we got to hang out afterwards. So that was that was very special. Um, beyond that, no, I really don't read out, out too much. Um, not sure why. I should probably address that. We have also solved from your web page that you have many other clients. A quick search on Audible shows that you have like two hundred and sixty-seven audiobooks on there. Uh, are you able to talk about some of the other work that you have done? And about, on average, how long does it take you to do an audiobook? I have done a lot of other books. I, I do a lot of hard science books. I do a lot of uh, self-help books. I work a lot with Christian audio. Um, I, I really enjoy doing all of these books because they let me examine the world from perspectives that I don't normally get to or wouldn't given my own, you know, political proclivities. Uh, but it lets me sit down with the author for 10 hours, 12 hours, and, uh, and learn what they think and what their arguments are and how well developed they are and if they make sense. And many of them do. Uh, most of them have, have at least some germ of, of something in there that I can... I can learn from and um, 
and even the ones that don't, and there are some that don't, um, of all political persuasions, you know, left, right, middle, top, bottom, back, front. Um, anybody can write a bad book. <laughs> The question is, uh, do I get in the way of the book by inflicting my own personal uh, beliefs on it, or do I let the author do uh, his or her thing? And I, I'm, I'm, I hope that I've been consistent in letting the author do their thing. Let them make their argument, and I'll step the hell out of the way and just learn what I learn during the course of the book. And I really enjoy doing that. So I'm, I've been very lucky to be able to work um, consistently and across a lot of different uh, uh, perspectives. What does it take to transition a book from paper to audio? If I can do, if it's a hard book, if it's a lot of pronunciations, a lot of French, a lot of German, something like that, uh, it'll take me two, I'll do two, two and a half hours a day before my brain just goes. Because um, I'll spend a lot of time researching. Uh, I do a lot of prep before the book, but even then I have to work while I'm doing the book to refresh my memory, make sure the uh, pronunciation is consistent, make sure I know what the hell I'm saying. Um, if it's a book that's simpler for me, for whatever reason, if it's right in my wheelhouse, say it's a cycling book and I know all the names, three hours uh, finished material a day, and that's you're looking at an eight hour day. Um, Maybe even a little more, depending on how much you're reading ahead. Sometimes I'll read the book for seven, eight hours a day, and then I'll go work on it for two or three hours. And so that's my my whole day. And when I say it out loud like that, it seems really, really uh, tiresome. Have you worked with other voice actors? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. In, in my capacity as a director and a producer uh, working for Random House in Los Angeles, I very happily worked with quite a few. I think I did something in the neighborhood of 250 books uh, on the other side of the on the other side of the booth, and it was wonderful. I I had worked with the best narrators in the business in that building, and it was amazing. I also see from your webpage that you have a nice audio booth. Do you work from home, or do you have an office, or which do you prefer? I have uh, I have a fairly good booth. I have I have an okay booth. Um, I would love to upgrade it. Uh, that is probably one of the things that's going to happen soon. I would love to build one into the basement, but then there's that thing of, hey, if I move, I'm leaving this booth, and pretty much. Nobody would want it, so they'd probably just tear it out if we were to sell the place and move on. So that's annoying. Um, so yes, I work at home, which is awesome if you've got two cats and a dog and you like to go ride your bike occasionally. Would I like an office? Do I work from an office? I don't work from an office. I used to at Random House. Um, I prefer working at home, although it can be a problem in that I go a little stir-crazy and I don't get to talk to a lot of people, so you go a little... Beyond that, it's fabulous. I, I would love to say I make my own hours. I don't. I just uh, I work as, as much and as often as I can, so my hours are made for me. Um, but I don't have to wear pants. I see that you used to do TV ads. Which do you prefer, voiceovers or audiobooks? I used to do a lot of commercials when I was younger. Um, I lived in Manhattan, and that's pretty much how I made my living. I would do the odd play. I'd actually do a lot of plays. Um, and then during the day, I would do commercials. I would go to auditions, or I would go to shoots. Um, I think I probably did 60 or 70, all told. Which, back then, there were only three... I'm old, so there were only three channels and some cable stations. So if you had a commercial, especially a national, and it ran, uh, you could live, not well, but you could live uh, six months on you know the, the earnings from one commercial, which is not too bad for a day's work. You know, it doesn't take into account all the other stuff that you did to get there, like school and the 1,000 auditions it took to get the damn thing. But, um, and then I would do occasional voiceover stuff as well. I was never very good at the voiceover stuff. I did a Rolling Rock campaign 
as the on-camera guy and I got the voiceover stuff from that because it was sort of trickle down, but I would never have gotten that without the on-camera. Um, yeah, I, I was just never able to crack the VO stuff. And audiobooks, do I like that more than commercials and, uh, and doing plays and movies? Yes. Um, it's, it's more consistent. It allows me to, even if I am working all the time to, you know, to get everything finished, I'm, I'm making that choice myself as opposed to being told by a, a commercial producer that I do or do not have the right, um, the right character to, you know, sell a freaking banana to people in Ohio who really don't care, you know. Uh, here, I just feel like the work is, is a little more uh, engaging and um, not important, that's a terrible word, um, but helpful. Important is a great word. I don't mean to denigrate the word, but helpful. Uh, people, this actually helps people. Selling them crap on TV, mm, not so much. Never really felt like I was moving us forward as a society um, when I was selling Sprint phones. Like many Americans, I get lots and lots of spam calls. How do you deal with these spam calls? Sometimes my husband likes to change his voice and mess with the people on the phone. I, 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 <laughs> I like that. Uh, it never occurred to me to do that, honestly. And I think that's just because I'm not really ultimately very imaginative. I think, though, now that you've mentioned it, next time somebody calls like that, I may just start weeping into the phone until they hang up. Just to see. Just to maybe make them feel a little weird. I'm not sure. I, but I don't, honestly, I don't get that many. If I don't recognize the area code, I ain't answering. Thank you, Sean, for taking time out of your day for this. Uh, where can uh, other followers go to find out more information about you or your work? Well, that's very considerate. Uh, thank you for having me. And, um, and yeah, if anybody wants to find out more about my work, uh, Audio File Magazine has uh, has reviews. Um, Audible, obviously, um, is a great place to find stuff. Uh, Sportybooks.com is my publishing uh, company, which is, we're just getting off the ground. We've got two books. Two. No, that's four. Two. Um, so Sporty Books is great. And then I'm on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and all of that the various and sundry social media. Um, so yeah, you know, if you're, if you're curious about what it is I'm doing, just Google me and probably you'll get pictures of me racing a bicycle. It's very boring. Thanks for having me. Part of this interview was done with the help of Columbia Access Television. If you would like to learn more or to donate to Columbia Access Television, please view visit columbiaaccess.tv. Music for this video was done with the help of Filmstro. You can find them online at filmstro.com. Come see what their music can do for you. If you like what you've seen here today, please consider subscribing. Also, if you have an audiobook or any other book that you would like reviewed, please comment below if you're watching on YouTube or email us at mirandamedia at gmail.com. I'm Monica Miranda. And I'm Robert Miranda. And thank you for watching.